Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to be seen. Amen. 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 Good to be seen. I came in and I uh, I got a text from Brother Jim today. Tell us that he evidently when he got home, if you were in the second service, Jim had a uh, amen at just the wrong time. Of course, it worked well for him because Jasmine wasn't here. Of course, Jasmine was watching online. So when he got home, I guess he got it. I come in a while ago, and I was just going to say hi to him, and I just touched the back of his arm, and he just jumped. I said, she must have really got after you. Yeah, buddy, I tell you, you have to be careful of them amens, amen, that's for sure. Anyway, well, I hope you've had a good afternoon. It's been a quiet day at our house. It was good. We needed it. But uh, it was good services this morning. Um, go ahead and take your Bibles out. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 13. I don't think I'm going to be very long tonight, to be honest with you. I think I'm probably going to be pretty quick, to be quite honest with you. Sunday night's kind of unusual. You know, Sunday mornings, I get about 30 minutes maximum. Sunday nights, I get about 45 minutes maximum. And uh, 45 minutes is a lot of material cover. So I will uh, cover what I have, and we will, we will say that's good. It's an interesting story tonight. I, uh, Nehemiah is interesting anyway. I mean, there's so many things about it that just are intriguing to me he was such a such a unique personality the fact that he could be a cupbearer a servant to this king had worked himself up to a, a very valued position with the with king Arxerxes, which was a a heathen king and yet then turn right around and become such a great project manager you know project management's not an easy thing it takes somebody that's got that knows how to deal with people you know if you don't have people skills, you're not going to be a very good project manager. You'll be running people off all the time or people be quitting on you all the time. You've got to kind of have a... And he had that. He was able to work with people. And people followed him. And they saw him as somebody that they could, that they could follow. Um, let's have a word of prayer. Father, Lord, I pray tonight that you'll just take hold and do what you want to do. Teach us, Father, the things we need to be taught. And Father, as we listen, as we hear, as we look into this particular passage... Help us, to, Father, maybe it's something we're already involved in that we need to correct, or maybe it's something, Father, in the future we need to watch out for. But, Lord, whatever it might be, just help us to, to take this in and be ready to use it when you give us the opportunity. We sure love you, and thank you, God, for giving us so much by way of instruction from the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. The people to this point have yielded to Nehemiah in building the wall. At first, you know, he showed up three days, he rides around. They don't know who he is or what he's doing. But when he gives them the, the plans, they bite. They take over. They get involved. And they start building. And they followed his leadership. They trusted his leadership whenever they had started finishing the wall and he started establishing their government. And they, they understood the importance of this leadership in the government. They also yielded themselves to God's word. When they found the word of God and they were reading the word of God and God's messenger stood, they stood in honor. They, they understood the importance of being God's people and obeying God's word. They had made commitments unto God by this covenant. Remember the covenant? It was written out and signed by them. Uh, turn, look over uh, Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 29. There, it's, that's how far back it was, if you believe that. But uh, this is where they made this covenant. Verse 29, chapter 10. They claimed to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe all to do the commandments of the Lord our God and his judgments and his statutes. And he goes on to say that they made a covenant and they signed it. They signed the covenant. And uh, they were serious about wanting to do what God said. People get serious about doing what God said. That's revival. I'm going to tell you, that's revival. Amen? When people get serious about just doing what God says. Boy, I tell you what, it sure makes the preacher's job easy. When people are ready to do what God says, it makes it an easy job for a preacher because all he has to do is just give them the word of God. They just do it. 
it's exciting. Thank you, Ruby. But, but they, had, they had made a decision to observe and do God's commands. They had, de- they had decided they would conduct business in a proper manner on the proper day. They honored the Sabbath. They, on- they said, we've got to do this God's way. They, had, they set up the tabernacles. They did all the things that they came to in the, in the law of God, and they would do those things. And they gave honor to, in place of the leaders. They, they honored their leaders, and we talked about that last week. But let's look at Nehemiah 13. Something's happened, and it's kind of interesting. It's the day of dedication. And uh, here we have an example of their dedication to the covenant when they separate from the Amorite and the Moabite as God's word had commanded. Verse 1 says, this is chapter 13, On that day they read the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonites and the Moabites should not come into the congregation of God forever, forever. Forever, They weren't to be a part. They weren't to be allowed. Why, verse 2? Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam, remember Balaam? Hired Balaam against them and that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. Now, they'd already done a thing about the marriages. Remember, we talked about that. But here, they've got another group of people. They've, evidently, there's been enough time that there's these mixed groups. There's other, other men that have come in and women, and they're mixed marriages where they're married from Jews to the Moabites or to the Ammonites, and they've begun to come in. And now they're having children, and their children are marrying and intermarrying. And, 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 the, and the, the, uh, the specialness, the... Uh, uh, the, the Jews chosen, man, I'm trying to think of the word. The, um, okay, you're not helping me, so that's okay. <laughs> I tell you, you don't know either, so that's good. <laughs> the uniqueness, the, the what? The, the, the exclusiveness of their, of, their Judy, of their Jewishness was being lost because they'd married these other Uh, people who served false gods. And so this was not to happen. God was very specific about that. It wasn't about skin color. It was about about their beliefs. And that's what made that uh, their their exclusivity was about that. And here this is this is they had they had begun to violate that once again. And as they read this in the word of God again as they read it and heard it they realized you know what we need to separate. And boy they just they did. If they were married to somebody that was a Moabite, sorry, you're out. You're no longer, you can't be a part here. You've got to get out of Jerusalem. We're not, you're not going to be here. You're not going to be a part of this. It's the way it was. And they were very serious about it. Now, notice verse 4. It begins with, and before this. So this begins a new passage. There's, they're referring to a time... And Nehemiah had left for a while, and now he's returned. He'd gone back to visit with Artaxerxes. He'd gone back as he promised. If you remember back, Artaxerxes, how long he'd be gone, he told him, and he expected him back. He had to go back and report. And uh, he had to go back because he wasn't sure even if Artaxerxes was going to let him come again. But he goes back and he meets with Artaxerxes and now he's gotten permission and he's come back. I don't know how long he was gone. He could have been gone a year. He could have been gone six months. I don't know. It was for a while. I think it was a pretty good while uh, because this had happened. This had begun to take place. Had Nehemiah been there, I don't think that would have happened. I think he would have probably been on top of it because Nehemiah is pretty sharp like that. But, uh, but when he gets back, there's something that he finds. Look at verse 4. It says, And before this, Eliashab the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of God, was allied to Tobiah. Tobiah. Where have we heard of Tobiah before? Do you remember? In the Bible. In the Bible. Thank you. <laughs> If I remember back, we're going to find him over in chapter 2. 
probably in 3 and 4 because I look at that verse 19. It says, And when Samballad the Hornite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, uh-oh, and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn. Tobiah was one of those three men who brought, were leaders of nations that came against them as they began to rebuild the wall. He was not an ally, he was an enemy. Elishai, the priest, should have known that, and I believe he probably did. But somehow or another, Tobiah has worked his way in. You know, Satan's minions have abilities to work their way in to the work of God. And I'm going to tell you, he worked his way, way in. Watch this. He says, and he prepared for him, this is Eliashab, prepared for Tobiah a great chamber. Wherefore, aforetime they had laid meat offerings and frankincense and the vessels and tithes of corn, the new wine, the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers and the porters and the offerings of the priest. Hello. This was a chamber that was part of the temple. It was part of the temple place. This is where people brought their tithe. This is where people brought their food and the things that they offered to God. And they gave it and it was stored there for the use by those who did the work in the temple. And uh, so it was, it was provided for that. Eliashem says, I, Tobiah, let me, uh, let me give you a place to stay. Let me fix you up a little apartment. Let me fix you up some place so you don't have to come in and out of Jerusalem. You can just stay here anytime you want to. Let me fix you up a little suite over here, you know. This will be good. Why would he do that? I don't know. There's a lot to that story I'm not sure about. I could probably guess. You know, Tobiah, if you remember back, Tobiah and Gershom were kind of the followers. Sanballat was kind of the leader. Sanballat was kind of the bad guy. And Tobiah and Gershom, they were kind of yes men. If Sanballat said, let's do it, yes, they'd do that. Sanballat would say something bad about those who were building the wall. And they would come along and say, that's right, that's right, that's right. You know, that's who they were. If, if, I were, if I could just read a little bit into this, I, I have a feeling that maybe these three men are still in cahoots with one another. I wouldn't be surprised if some of this hadn't happened because of sand ballads uh, trying to interfere with the work of God and had set this up. Tobiah may have had a better rapport with Eliashab after Nehemiah. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It was after Nehemiah left. You can be sure of that. Nehemiah had gone to see Artaxerxes and told, oh, I, I can almost hear Sam Ballard say, Tobiah, why don't you go up there and visit with Eliashab? You know, he's a nice guy and he likes you. He, there's something about your relationship. Why don't you go up and visit with him? See if you can work your way in just a little bit. Let's see if we, if we can't keep them from building these walls and doing this. Let's see if we can get in there and we can interrupt the worship. Let's see if we can do that. And I think that's what happened. And Tobiah came in. Hey, Alicia, hey, brother, give me five. Woo-hoo, man, it's good to see you. How's things going? Hadn't seen you in a while. Hadn't been up in a while, you know. Uh, Nehemiah kind of didn't like me, but I'm here now, and I want to just come by and see how things are going. I can hear him working his way in, you know. And it wasn't long how much time it took. I don't think it probably took very long. I think Tobiah had the ability to really work his way in. Tobias says, boy, I tell you what, I have to, I have to come so far to come here. And I, then I, I don't have a place to stay, and I don't know what to do. And Eliashab, being the good priest that he was, you know, wanting to be helpful. Well, let me, uh, let me see if I can find a space for you. You know, Eliashab, there's, a, there's one, one of the rooms, it's in the far, it's one that they use for storage, you know, and nobody's used it, it's just for storage. It sure would make a nice little room for me to be able to stay in, you think? Well, let me look into that. I think it would be great. You want me to help you? I'll, I'll help you move the stuff out. <laughs> However it happened. But he, he had taken that room that was used for the storing of the foods for the, for the priests, for the singers, for, in fact, we'll read about this as well. And, and, and in fact, it said, he said, the, the phrase was for the singers, the porters, the priests, 
This, was the, this is how they took care of their families. This is how they were able to stay there in Jerusalem to take care of the temple. They didn't have to go outside the walls and have a, a farm. They didn't have to go outside the walls to take care of themselves. They were taken care of by the people. That was the way God had set it up. That's the way Nehemiah had set it up. But now, you know what I, you know what I can assume from this? That I bet these people, the singers, the porters, and priests, are no longer around to do the work of the temple because they've got to go outside to find a place where they can farm and take care of their families because the food's not coming in like it was before. There's no place to put it. I think this interrupted everything. Eliashab's alliance with Tobiah was an evil alliance. It was an unholy alliance because they stood against Nehemiah and the leadership that Nehemiah had provided. They stood against the worship. They wanted to stop the building of the wall. They wanted to stop the worship at the temple. That was their desire. And Eliashab had been bought into this to make them allies. And now because they've set up this room for uh, Tobiah to stay in, they now have robbed God's work of the needed revenues that they needed in order to do the work of God. They have wormed their way in and they have literally caused enough chaos to keep the work of God from proceeding the way God had intended. And it was going to show up pretty quick because things weren't going to go right. Verse 6 says, But in all this time was not I, this is Nehemiah, at Jerusalem. For in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, came I unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave of the king. So when Nehemiah gets back and he goes around the city and he begins to see that something's not quite right. Where are the singers and where are the priests? Where, where are all the people that are supposed to be taking care of the temple? Oh, well, they've, they've had to move out. Well, why? Well, the rooms that uh, they use to store their food is being used for something else. What? what, what what's being put in there? We need to fix that. Something's not right. But look at verse 7. And I came to Jerusalem and understood the evil that Eliashab did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore. You know it did. It not only grieved him, I think it made him mad. I think he got angry about it. Nehemiah leader was never aware of this kind of deception. He never would have ex anticipated this happening. When he left, everything was under control. The people were serving God. They were excited about the word of God. When he left, things were, the government was set up. He had set his brother and, and Hananiah to be over the leadership. And they, they, he had everything set up. Everything was good when he left. And when he came back, he expected to find it like it was. But it's not. Because Tobiah has wormed himself in. Taken, taken up residence in the house of the Lord. In a room that wasn't prepared for him, but prepared for these goods that were to be used. He's grieved by this alliance that had been allowed to take place. Look at verse 8. It goes on to say, Therefore I cast forth all the household stuff with Tobiah the chamber. See, now Nehemiah is a great leader. You know, there's times when leaders need to be diplomatic. And there's times when leaders need to just take charge. Nehemiah knew the new when to do each. And this was a time when he knew it was time to take charge. He didn't need to get permission to do this. This was right to do. There wasn't any need to okay this with Eliashab or the other priests or anybody else. He didn't need to do that. He didn't need to call for a council meeting or a committee meeting. He didn't need to. He just said, let's take care of this because it was wrong to do. Verse 9 says, then I commanded and they cleansed the chambers. Notice that it says chambers. See, we read a while ago that it was a chamber, but now it's chambers. I don't think Tobiah just took one chamber. I think he kept taking chambers. He not only wanted a place to stay, he wanted a place to, to uh, have his friends come. He wanted to have a place to uh, relax. He wanted to have a TV room, and he wanted to have a, a sports room, and he wanted to have a bedroom, and he wanted to have a kitchen, and he just kept taking rooms. Chambers. He commanded that they cleanse the chambers 
And then there brought I again the vessels of the house of God when the meat offerings and the frankincense. He said, this is enough. He didn't go ask Tobiah to move out. He, I didn't, he, he didn't want his name going, uh, excuse me, Tobiah, I, I'm sorry, but uh, it seems like you've taken over a room that belongs to us and we need you to move out. When do you think you could do that? He didn't do that. He went down to the house, opened the door, the chamber opened the door, and I think he started just throwing stuff out as fast as he could. People come walking by, what's going on? Nehemiah's in there cleaning it out. Does Tobiah know? Well, no. What's he going to say? He's not going to say anything because Nehemiah is cleaning it out. He doesn't belong in there. And I think Nehemiah probably with every piece of furniture he threw out, he would say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Who does this man think he is? God, this is God's house. He doesn't belong here. You know, he personally threw everything of Tobias out. He, then he ordered the cleansing of the chamber. I don't know if Tobias was a dirty man or not, but evidently Nehemiah thought it needed fumigating. I don't know if he stunk. I don't know if he just wasn't clean. But, I, but whatever it was, Tobiah didn't want any scent of that man in that room. He wanted it all cleaned out and he wanted it scrubbed down to the, to the bare walls. He wanted it done. Because this was not a place for Tobiah. He restored the chamber and the chambers to their proper use. That's what a leader will do. Now, let me just say this. This was determined a long time ago with Nehemiah. He would not live with wrong in the place that was built for right. I think we have to, uh, we have to make decisions in our life before we're it is always good if we can do that before we're, we have to address the situation. Now, sometimes it's on the fly. Sometimes we have to say, you know what? Uh, we, we can't do this because this is not right. We've gotten involved with something we shouldn't. Let's get out of it. But you know what? We should decide before it ever happens, before it ever comes to that place, what we're going to do. I remember Dr. Hiles. He said his mama, whenever he was growing up, she took... In, it took magazines and they had cigarette ads in them. And she'd tear the cigarette out and put it on the floor and she'd step on it and stomp on it and say, bad, bad, bad. She said, come on, Jackie, step on that and say bad. And he'd step on it and say, bad, bad, bad. And she'd take the liquor ads out and she'd throw them on the floor and she'd stomp on it and say, bad, bad, bad. Jackie, come over here, step on that and say, bad, 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 bad. He said, when he got to be a teenager... And they were in a car and somebody passed the liquor bottle around. He said when he saw the liquor bottle, all he could think about was, Bad, bad, bad. And he told him, I can't do that, it's bad. It had been predetermined, the response he was supposed to have. We need to have that kind of response. We need to know what we would do or, or how we'd handle things. You know, as a preacher, there's a lot of things we have to, I, I, I anticipate we'll have to deal with as a church. And I have to think through, how will I handle that? What will I say? What will I do? How will I take care of that? If I'm put in that position, what am I going to say? And I, I, I have pre-planned a lot of things. I wish I could say all of them because sometimes they sneak up on me. But, you know, that's the way it ought to be. We ought to have it in our being that this is already predetermined. I don't have to think about if it's right or wrong. It's wrong. If something's right, you know it's right. And somebody says, let's do something other than what's right. No, I can't. Why? Because it's wrong. Well, why is it wrong? Because it's wrong. Because it's not right. That's why it's wrong. Amen. I mean, it's, it's not right. He had decided that wrong doesn't belong in the place of right. Tobiah was wrong. He was an enemy, not an ally. He had no business being that place. And he was an Ammonite, which was somebody they said they didn't need to have in the place. He wasn't even supposed to be there. Nehemiah understood that. Other people may have turned their backs on it and said, well, you know, let somebody else deal with it. Nehemiah says, nobody else needs to do it. I'll take care of it. And he does. 
We need to be those kind of people. We love, we care, we're kind, but sometimes we need to put our foot down. Say enough's enough. No more. We're not going to play that game. When I think about Daniel, he didn't tolerate evil. When he was told to bow down and pray to the image, why well, he immediately went to his house and he began to pray to God. Picked him up, brought him down, threw him in the, the uh, lion's den, and threw him down the lion's den. And I think it was uh, J. Vernon McGee. He said he dropped him down in that lion's den. Those lions walked up and sniffed him and knew there wasn't no sense trying to bite him. He was three quarters gristle and one quarter backbone. It would just be a waste of time. Of course, God protected him because he wasn't going to bow. It had already been predetermined. He didn't have to think about it. He didn't have to think about what it would cost him. He didn't think about, well, you know, if I don't bow, then I'm going to lose my position as one of the, one of the, one of the princes of, uh, of Babylon. I, I won't be able to give influence to the king. I mean, there's a lot of things I'll lose. I, I won't have an income anymore. What will I do? He didn't think about that. He did what was right. He knew what was right to do. Nehemiah knew he must always be on guard as to whom his associates would be. From day one, he had struggled with these guys. He knew he had to keep his guard up. And the minute he's gone, one of them slips in. Let's think of some other great men just real quick. What about Joshua and Caleb? I love those two guys, don't you? I mean, those two guys are amazing. When it came time and they'd come back from over checking out the promised land, God had told them to go in. They said, let's go, let's go look, look and see if it's like you say. And sure enough, they go over to the promised land, 12 of them. They come back, 10 of them get up and say, it's just like God said, but oh, there's giants over there. They'll eat us alive. We can't go over there. We're, we're like little grasshoppers to them. And Joshua and Caleb says, hold it. If it's right to go, it's right to go. Well, let's go. Don't sit here. Don't turn your backs on God. Let's go. They didn't stop and think, well, you know, they might be right. There were some giants over there. And, and you know, we've, 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 we're, we're doing all right. I mean, it's not the best, but, we, you know, it's, it's better than dying over there. And they didn't think that. God had told them to go. Let's go. They stood their ground for God. Do you realize what it cost them? Think about it. You know, I don't think we think about this. It cost them 40 years in the wilderness. They had to live in the wilderness just like everybody else. They ate manna every day. They had to do with whatever God provided for them. They said, you know, just like everybody else. And let me tell you something else. They lost every one of their family members in that 40-year period. They watched them die. It cost them a lot to stand for God. But they stood. And God blessed them for it. I think of Moses. Man, he had to stand. He had to stand against Pharaoh. My goodness. Well, let's go back. He had he'd been brought up as a Hebrew. His mama had taught him and had told him he was a Hebrew. He'd been brought up as a Hebrew. And this Egyptian has beaten one of his brothers. And he jumps in and says, you don't get to do that. And he kills the Egyptian. Of course, he didn't think about what that was going to cost him. He didn't say, oh my goodness, if I do that, I won't be the Pharaoh's adopted son, grandson or son. I won't be a grandson. I won't be the Pharaoh's adopted grandson. I'll lose position. I'll lose everything. He didn't think that. He took care of business. It did cost him. He spends 40 years in Midian herding sheep. That's not a very elusive job after being a prince of Egypt, you know. You move from the palace to the, to the, to the what? To the, other to the other palace, yeah. I was going to say the Palisades, but it wasn't the Palisades. It was uh, the rocks of Midian to herd goats and sheep. and That's a stinky job. He did it for 40 years. And then God calls him and said, all right, now go up there and take care of my business with Pharaoh. And he says, wait a minute, God. God said, go. And he went. 
And ten times he has to go to Pharaoh, knowing that Pharaoh was going to turn his back on him and not allow him to leave. He didn't. He just did what God said. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those three Hebrew boys, young men, had decided we're going to live for God. We're going to be, a, a, we're going to be an example to others of what it is to live for God in this, in this land of Babylon that doesn't even know who our God is. We're going to be an example. We're going to stand for what's right. And Nebuchadnezzar told them, you'll bow to that image, and if you don't, I'm going to burn you in that fire. Remember what they said? We're not careful how we answer you. Um, we're, not, we're not careful how we answer you, Nebuchadnezzar. Whether God saves us or not, we will not bow. And he threw them in the fire and God delivered them. Why? Because they stood for what was right. They'd made a decision before they came down to it. We will not bow. We will not burn. And I think of Paul. We talked about Paul last week. And man, Paul wouldn't be defeated. People turned their backs. They screamed at him. They hollered at him. They called him names. They maligned him. They tried to run down his ministry. They beat him. They stoned him. They'd run him out of town. But he wouldn't stop. He'd made a decision that no matter what, he was going to be God's servant, just the way God had called him. He was the apostle of Jesus Christ, called by God. And he wasn't going to let anything stop him or defeat him. Nehemiah is a great example for us, number one, of being careful who we align ourselves with. Being careful of listening to people whenever they try to pull us away from what we know is right to do. I think Nehemiah gives us a great example of how we're supposed to be predetermined about how we're going to respond to evil. What are you going to do? When you have to face with evil, how are you going to handle it? When you have to be, when you are faced with a child or a grandchild or someone that wants to turn their backs on your God and attack you because of your beliefs, how are you going to handle that? We need to know because it's going to happen. It will happen. We live in a day and time when this whole world is doing some crazy things. I'm so glad my kids are raised. I pray for my grandkids every night. What are you going to do when they come home from school and they've been taught that they're not really a little boy or they're not really a little girl? What are you going to do? How are we going to handle that? What are we going to say? I'm going to take them to the preacher and let him handle That's what you're going to do. No. We need to know. What do we believe and why do we believe it? And are we willing to stand for what we believe? And it needs to be about this own word of God. Amen. If you'll just stand on this, you'll be fighting a lot. Because they're going to be attacking this old book like they have all the time. And you're, you've got plenty to fight for right here. You don't have to worry about trying to find anything else to fight for. Just, just stand on what the word of God says. That's all we have to do. All right? I got done early. Fifteen minutes early. Any question, comment, or thought? All right, then, let's stand and be dismissed with a word of prayer. Thank you for being here and hope it was a blessing to you. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this evening. I pray, God, as we've looked at Nehemiah and we realize what a man of God he was, how he stood, Father. He knew when something was wrong and he fixed it. Lord, I pray we'll be people like that. That when we see something wrong, we won't turn the other way, but we will we'll address it. We'll take care of it. We'll, we'll do what you ask us to do, Lord, in the time that you give us to do it. And Lord, I pray your protection over all of us as we're faced every day now more and more with the attacks of Satan against just the simple things of living. And Lord, let us be true to your word. Let us be um, wise as serpents, harmless as doves. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.